experimental nature or new venture creation. That is very, very important. That actually goes back to the comments of the uh, prior speaker, which I very much appreciate. Indeed, it's about both patience and speed. And uh, Commissioner Quinn and Dr. Smits, Director of uh, Research and Innovation, were in Washington over the last few years. He was there last February, and we're talking about this issue, and I challenged him in a way. Let me start with this. Uh, to focus on the mid-range universities across Europe. There's a tremendous advantage of human, intellectual, and social capital that is not being tapped. We talk about, you know, this is an island of Europe on the northwest corner. We know there's another one on the southeast corner. They're both, by the way, divided, but they're also very challenged along with many other countries. The point being is that we talk about countries going bankrupt, and we have a multitude of what I would call knowledge banks whose value-added assets are not even properly assessed, let alone leveraged and monetized. I'm talking about the universities. And I know this can be provocative to some, but indeed, as I said to some that uh, engage with me in, in, thankfully, constructive dialogue, entrepreneurship is a very profounded, profoundly Marxist concept. It helps you get control or gain control of the key uh, re resources or assets and modes of production, but you do it as a free individual not as someone obeying to a you know, top-down uh, directive. So I think there's a very important uh, mission here, and it's beyond politics. And by the way, since we talked about uh, you know, people in New York, they're good at, with acronyms, as we are. So they came up with this uh, PIGS, you know, Portland, uh, Portugal, Ireland, Greece, and Spain, right? So I came up with my own version of that. And I said we should all be, and this is the, the, the challenge uh, that, that I'm coming to, we should all be smart allocentric pigs. And that means patient innovation gardeners, okay? And, and the challenge to Dr. Smiths and everybody else is to focus on the mid-range universities and try to have 10,000 spin-offs, not 100. This is an order of magnitude. And that's where I believe it's worth taking the high-risk approach with a quadruple and quintuple, which is really including the environment in this discussion. Helix, because yes, there is memory and there is biological computing, as you described it in the, in the double helix experiment. But that's exactly why we may indeed have actually a tipping point. We may have some kind of even a butterfly effect. If we get the ingredients, the right ingredients right and engage in the right way, we may have tremendous speed and acceleration of innovation effects. Okay? So let me uh, go into this before I run out of time. The idea here is, uh, you know, so smart, sustainable, and inclusive growth. And I guess what is important, and I apologize for the slides, they're not very polished, but I think they have some interesting ideas in them. Um, I came from uh, Finland, and before that I was in Austria. And we, we're just starting actually, Martin, two new book series. One with Paul Grave Macmillan, Democracy, Innovation, and Entrepreneurship for Growth. And I'll talk about democracy in this context. Uh, politics and values matter in the right way, of course, in the context of innovation pursuit. So I call people and I invite them to become jihadists for growth. Die for growth is the acronym of that series. Democracy, innovation, entrepreneurship for growth. And the other one, Whispringer also, launched with the uh, editor, with the rector of the University of Vienna uh, of Advanced Arts, Dian Gevante, Arts, Research, Innovation, and Society. And we'll be focusing on how, again, different ways and means of creativity can be tapped. We do not and cannot afford to ignore any asset in, in any way anymore. This is, I think, the key, the key point here. So these are the books, by the way, and this is the one I'm talking about, and it's just off, part of the press. And this is also a prior one, also very valuable with uh, uh, you, Piero, and Thomas Anderson, Knowledge Driven Entrepreneurship. Now, yesterday I went to uh, County Wicklow and also Bray. I, my, my first time in Ireland, as Martin said, I'm you know, as Euro-American as they come, and I'm very happy and proud to be here for the first time. Really enjoyed it. I uh, took some lovely pictures. This is the uh, tower for those who know and those who don't. It's a beautiful sight. Uh, but it's, this is the idea about looking back to see ahead, which is the essence of history. And this is important, too. And one of the reasons why Europe has tremendous advantages. Now, let me make briefly mention, and these slides will be on, 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 online, right? So I'm not going to be, um, be focusing selectively on things for the issue of time. Uh, there is a very interesting research in the USNNT, the issue, the question of China, how China stopped being innovative in the, mid, uh, uh, in, in, in the Middle Ages. It was the leader in many ways, in many fields. This is not just about China, it's about everybody else, about understanding the nature of innovation. It's a socio-technical, socio-economic, and socio-political phenomenon. 
And this guy studied for years and with many, uh, many books trying to figure out this. I'll tell you if you have time at the end the answer to these questions. Why and how did this happen? And whether he figured it out. Now, in the world, we have this situation nowadays, ubiquity standards that are open, new business designs. Um, and by the way, my second challenge, um, I don't believe we have open innovation. Again, I do not believe we have open innovation. We don't have OI 2.0. We have TOY 2.0, again, playing with acronyms. Targeted open innovation, in my opinion. And we don't have, uh, with all due respect, co-creation, or in some cases at least, we have co-petition, co-evolution, and co-specialization. And I'm sure you mean that in some ways as well. I don't believe in, you know, um, uh, open uh, for anything goes situation and circumstances. It doesn't work that way. And this is why perhaps in many ways large companies, but also entrepreneurs, do not truly really engage. And in fact, in our efforts and our research, we're doing macro, meso, and micro level qualitative and quantitative research to really understand, for instance, how you know, ecosystems are architected and how they work. And we're finding the Jacob effect. Unless you hit a critical mass of connectivity in terms of both quantity and quality of innovation and knowledge exchange, there is no value added. You're wasting time and resources joining a cluster, joining a network, and entrepreneurs know that intuitively. And when, of course, the critical mass is exceeded, like in some places in the US and possibly elsewhere, they can wait to join. What's the mission? From artificial, from natural scarcity to artificial abundance. You know, Star Trek, they weren't using money in Star Trek. They had the replicator. I'd love to. You know, now we have the 3D printer. And this could be a hugely interesting disruptive technology in many areas. And the idea here is that, uh, of course, scarcity helps create and sustain markets in some ways. But artificial scarcity driven by greed and fear can actually destroy nations and, and even the world. So then we need a balance. And that's where we come in, I think. And the mission is to uh, achieve um, a, an abundance that is artificial to some extent and as needed, but certainly also natural and the sustainability factor comes into this. The key resources and inputs to economic activity, just a quick uh, frame, point of reference, land, labor, capital, technology, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, I'm sorry, technology, entrepreneurship, and knowledge, and the, the synthesis of those and the result of those is innovation. Um, about the triple quadruple and quintuple helix. This is not about playing words with game, playing uh, words with, with games with words. This is about actually understanding the importance of the bottom up complementing the top down. The triple helix is a great concept that identifies the key agents and the roles and the actors. Government, university, industry. But if you only have policies and initiatives, as has been the case in Europe for too long, from the top down, you end up having disconnects. You end up having the opposite of what you would like. I think. So the, the bottom up is very important, civil society and also an awareness of the environment is critical. And that's what we're discussing in Finland, by the way. I'm working with people on the RIS3 initiative, smart specialization strategies at the regional level. And we had some wonderful insights and discussions there. And I'm very optimistic in the end about Europe, actually. And in fact, I hope in some ways the US becomes like Europe in that regard. And I certainly hope Asia also converges, but that's a longer discussion. Um, now, the, the creative glue, this is what the social and natural aspects, the quadruple and quintuple hill considerations are about. And if we don't have that, we have externalities, transactional costs. Basically, innovation becomes increasingly costly and in a manner that is hidden and comes back to haunt us, as we've seen in many cases. Here is a graphical representation of that, uh, of these, uh, the, 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 the helices, uh, you know, government, university, industry, uh, media-based and culture and civil society. This is the fourth strand and the environment around it. Another way to look at it uh, in terms of taking the democracy uh, considerations into context uh, and the knowledge society and economy as well. Again, you need to have a balance of these. This is a slide from, from Finland where we're discussing in the case of uh, Finnish region uh, how this is implemented and set up as a quadruple helix. Um, innovation, of course, is not something easy to accomplish as we know and I'll just quote Machiavelli real quick. And we need to remember that that's the patience. And in fact, courage and imagination are very important. It was mentioned earlier, you know, dare to act and all that. Indeed, dare to imagine and dare to dare are very important. Um, and I mentioned the target of open innovation idea here. Uh, the point is that we, we can't just uh, either assume everybody will, 
uh, is going to be sharing openly. And by the way, a fascinating concept with uh, the, the, dub, the digit dubs. I love the, uh, the cartoons. There is a concern I have about Big Brother, but maybe it's my biases. Uh, you know, knowing even you know whether and how you're throwing garbage in the bin and what's happening there, but that's not necessarily. You know, I'm sure there is a positive aspect to that. How innovation takes place? Innovation takes place across sectors, technologies, and it's a process of discovery, development, deployment, diffusion, and commercialization. So you really need to be aware of all of these, and whether it's the uh, European Institute of Technology or any other uh, entity, you really need to, as was discussed, integrate across, because. We have very few that succeed. We have the value of death, and it's not just about money, as we know. It's very much about mindsets. Innovation is a way of life, and all the things that we've been discussing. And in the end, you need to have high quality and quantity of experiments. This is really what it boils down to. That's why I mentioned about the 10,000 spin-offs as a challenge and a concept. Innovation is localized, global and local. Uh, we are moving from trades of goods to trades of tasks, and we have for some time. This is very significant for what we're discussing here, and a huge advantage, in my mind, in a smart specialization sense for Europe. Uh, and in S3 being smart specialization strategies, the technology life cycle is full of opportunities for uh, taking advantage and creating startups, depending on what technology you're talking, what stage you're in. And this is where we need to be aware of and, and engage because there's always limits of physics and diminishing economic returns. This is really at the heart of the creative destruction dynamic and the superterian uh, idea. I mentioned co-opetition, co-evolution, co co-specialization. It seems to us in work from promo what we're studying, these things happen in a way that creates temporary transient balances that then again are disruptive. This is the, the way nature works and this is the way innovation works more or less. They are really at the heart of this uh, processing of the brew between inputs and outputs. And this is how this all comes together. The idea with the smart specialization strategies and thinking in quadruple and quintuple helix terms is about optimizing the frontier, maximizing the value, not competing on being cheap. It's not about minimizing cost, and this is very important. You should be always strategically trying to maximize the value added and enhance product effectiveness and efficiency as well as leveraging integration and reach. And this is where the, the, the digital initiatives come into play because they allow us to connect, they allow us to connect across government, university, industry, uh, and civil society. And the way that happens globally, regionally, or locally is in terms of the four, four nodes. And this is where we have this other idea we're, we're, we're using in terms of simulating and analyzing the ecosystems of innovation uh, the knowledge, serendipity knowledge arbitrage ideas. Depending on how well connected, how proactively and all that, and was mentioned before by my colleague that this is indeed is a, is a connectivity technology in media. The conference is a, is, a, is a knowledge sharing technology. You are more likely than not to find the things that you're missing that will really trigger your thinking, complement your, your, your vision, bring clarity and purpose. How you interpret that, so this is the serendipity. The arbitrage is how you interpret that, how well prepared you are, knowledgeable, experienced, and interacted with others to be on the front end, quasi front end of innovation. So strategic knowledge arbitrage and serendipity are important ideas that we've embedded in our research. And this is one way you can think of, of an innovation ecosystem. Very busy slide, but the idea is that it's multi-level, multilateral, multi-modal, multi-nodal. This is how how we represent things, and the, the, glob the globus there, if you wish, constitute of, consists of people, culture, and technology ingredients. Um, a couple of more things, and this is an example of the research we're doing in terms of uh, modeling innovation ecosystems and using system dynamics approaches to understand what works, how, why, and when, or why not. Uh, and we're also looking at different regions. We're comparing US, EU, and US regions. We're looking at places like uh, Minologic, which is in Grenoble, with the greater Washington area, and we're mapping different, you know, the networks analysis, mapping partners across the quadruple helix frontier to understand, to look at the relationships and the nodes and the dynamics, to really understand and hopefully predict at some point if we have a certain kind of intervention, if there is an investment by the EU or the IT or whatever, in a certain way, how will that, what impact will that have? Okay. Policy effects. Another, and I'm closing with this study we did, is comparing Portugal and Maryland, looking at different ingredients and actors, uh, the regional innovation network context, 
uh, along with quadruple helix the, uh, idea of, of these two, well, a country and a state in the US. And this is uh, real quick, the, 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 the components we looked at. Um, the comparison, so we looked at entrepreneurs being the civil society, government, academia, and industry, uh, and how they are interconnected, how they're present, and just closing the industry map uh, in terms of the different sectors, biotech, chemical, energy, ICT, and media, and uh, by clusters in terms of Maryland and Portugal. How, how they engage and how they connect across the quadruple helix. And some of our findings, let me focus here. Uh, academia and entrepreneurs tend to focus on the product dimensions. This needs to be understood and, and anticipated versus government and industry that focus on the business dimensions. And so when you work with all these, you need to engage in a manner that actually allows you to leverage the strengths and minimize the weaknesses. I will stop. Uh, the slides are going to be online, so I thank you all for your time and attention.